Turn your Bibles to Psalm 116. Psalm 116. Just want to read the first two verses of this psalm, and then we'll pray and seek the face of God once again. The psalmist says, I love Jehovah because he hears my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I call upon him as long as I live. Let's once again seek the face of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, we have many times before sought your face, and you have been gracious to bless our gatherings. You have helped us to sing your praises. We have sought your face in prayer. We have heard the prophecies of the coming Messiah, of the glorious kingdom that he will reign over. And we long for that day. But now, Lord, we come to your word, and we are once again in need of your Spirit's help but having called upon you and know you to be a God who hears and answers prayer, we call upon you in confidence again. Grant us your spirit that we might hear your word and it might be applied to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to date myself with my opening illustration. That's okay. Macrame. You remember those twined together creations with yarn and hemp? They made just about anything you can imagine out of yarn. Tying it in knots, hanging it from hooks, making pot hangers, lamps. All kinds of things were made out of macrame and those many, many different kinds of knots. Some poetry, some songs, are like macrame. It's very hard in any way to outline them simply and to really capture the whole essence of what's there because the thoughts run in and out of one another. They're intertwined in various ways to give a view from one angle of this kind of picture and then from another angle of this picture, just like those knots from one side look smooth, the other side have a, have a design to them. The psalm that I'd like for us to consider this evening, Psalm 116, is like that. It's a psalm which is very difficult to outline, at least in my estimation, and from the various commentators that I read, uh, and the different ways they outlined it, I think it's probably true for them as well. But then we would expect that in some measure from poetry. This is not prose. This is not an essay. This is a poem. Hebrew poetry. It's a song of thanksgiving. And having reflected upon and in light of the recent uh, holiday that we had and the time that we had as a congregation to give praise and thanks to God, I thought it would be appropriate and my mind was drawn to think upon a song of thanksgiving for the people of God. Psalm 116 is that psalm. It is an intensely intricate psalm with profound truths woven in, we'll see a, a couple of them at least, like beads in the midst of the macrame. It is an intensely emotional psalm. There are many highly charged words from the very outset to the end. And it is an intensely personal psalm. Well, with those three descriptions, follow along now as I read Psalm 116 before we delve in to an exposition of this psalm this evening. I love Jehovah because he hears my voice and my supplications. 
because he has inclined his ear to me. Therefore I call upon him as long as I live. The cords of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Jehovah, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is Jehovah and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. Jehovah preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Return to your rest, O my soul, for Jehovah has dealt bountifully with you. For you have rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I shall walk before Jehovah in the land of the living. I believed when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my alarm, all men are liars. What shall I render to Jehovah for all his benefits toward me? I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of Jehovah. I shall pay my vows to Jehovah. Oh, in the presence of all his people, precious in the sight of Jehovah is the death of his godly ones. Oh, Jehovah, surely I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of Jehovah. I shall pay my vows to Jehovah. Oh, in the presence of all his people, in the courts of Jehovah's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem, praise ye the Lord. We'll look at this psalm under three headings. The first is the main point. It's my first heading this evening, the main point. The main point is a declaration of love for Jehovah. The psalmist is determined in this psalm to let everyone know that he loves God. He's going to say it with his words and then he's going to describe why and how he expresses that love. And so as we look at this main point, the declaration of love for Jehovah, I want us first of all to look at the unique opening knot of our song of thanksgiving macrame. The unique opening knot. I love Jehovah. Don't forget that. As we go through the entire psalm, keep those words before your mind. I love Jehovah. Jehovah. That's his point. That's what he wants to get across. That's what he wants to explain. That's what he wants to expound. He begins with just a, a very short and terse statement. I love. Literally. There is no other statement like it, exactly like it, in the entire Old Testament. The closest we come is Psalm 18 and verse 1. And when the psalmist, after we have that lengthy heading about David being a servant of the Lord, and he said, I love you, O Jehovah, my strength. Now the Hebrew is different in these two, and the one that we're looking at is unique in that it, the object is not obvious in the Hebrew. The, obvious of what, the object of what is being loved is not patent. And so some of the translators translate it, I love because Jehovah answers my prayers, basically. And that's legitimate. But I believe the major testimony of the major, or the, the, over, the testimony of the major English translations, all of which translate it, I love Jehovah, is a good testimony as to the accuracy of this approach, this translation, I love Jehovah. Jehovah. Now the Hebrew for the word love is in what's called the Hebrew perfect tense for you Hebrew students out there. For the Greek students it's an aorist tense in the Septuagint. Both are used to describe something, those two tenses, as having been completed. But the psalmist is not saying, I once loved Jehovah. 
I loved Jehovah in the past, nor is he obviously saying anything about something he hopes will come in the future, but he's making a statement about the fact that his love is a complete love. It's not a warm, fuzzy, transient feeling. He's talking about a dedication, a commitment, an intimacy, an attachment, which is a settled posture before Jehovah. I love Jehovah. He is deeply in love with his God. That's the unique and opening knock, which is necessary, and everything else begins to flow from that. He then goes on to talk about the cause for this declaration of affection. This is not the cause of his love, but the cause of the declaration for, that we have at the outset of this psalm. What brought him to this particular expression of love? What, as it were, bursted off of, the, of his lips? Notice that both at the middle of verse 1 and at the beginning of verse 2, you say the same word, because. Here's the cause. He hears my voice and my supplications. He has inclined his ear to me. It's because Jehovah listens. Jehovah is a sympathetic listener. Like a mother who's standing before a crowd of dozens or maybe more children can hear one voice, Mommy, above all the others. God hears his child's voice and he can pick out that voice. He hears my voice. Jehovah is also a, like the parent who hears the cry of the hurt child. And as soon as that child hits the ground, or as soon as that child cuts himself, or as soon as that child, ah, the parent is, is over there. What's wrong? He hears my supplications. He hears my pleas for mercy. He is a sympathetic listener. He knows my voice. He knows my pleas for mercy. And he's an attentive listener. Notice it says that he has inclined his ears to me. One of those nifty Hebrew expressions, he stretches his ear to me. It's like the tallest among us seeking to listen to the smallest child among us and having to bend down really low to be able to hear. And it's not because he has no ability to hear, but it's because he wants to show, I want to hear every word that you have to whisper. I'm going to bring my ear, as it were, right to your mouth so you can whisper your concerns right into my ear and know that I have heard. I love Jehovah, he says, because... He is a sympathetic listener. He is an attentive listener. And he is a consistent listener. And here again, the tense of the verbs is important. And I won't bore you with all the various ways it can be understood, but the present tense used in the New American Standard and the Old American Standard capture this best. He hears my prayer, my voice. Not just he will hear them. Not he has heard them. But he is a God who has heard, will hear, and does hear. He is always hearing. He is a, a prayer hearing God. And so the present tense best captures this. This is the cause at the moment that the psalmist is writing, that he's contemplating, that moves him to say, I love Jehovah. Why? Because he hears my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear or inclines his ear to me. And that moves his heart to show an expression of that love. And we have this expression seen not just in the words, I love you, but in the last line of verse 2, therefore I shall call upon him as long as I live. 
Well, since I've called upon him and I know he hears, and it moves me to love him, I'm going to call all the more. Have, have you ever been with one of those people that is just the quintessential listener? The kind of person that just sits and soaks. It's like they're a big sponge that sits in front of you. And you know, if you're like me and you're kind of the quintessential talker, you get around somebody like that and it just kind of keeps coming because they just keep listening. And their ears are just open and they just keep listening and drawing it out from you. Pastors call congregations that are especially uh, attentive or they, they, they describe them as those who draw the word out of them so that they forget, oh, the clock went by the hour several minutes ago. Right? Because there was this attention and it was just coming and drawing it out. You're around somebody like that and you just, you just want to pour out everything to them. There's something in them that shows that. Well, Jehovah is that kind of God to the psalmist. And having poured out all of his burdens into his ears and knowing he's a God who hears, he says, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm just going to keep pouring out my requests. And literally, this is a lifelong commitment that he's making to continue to call upon the Lord. And more literally, it's not as long as I live, as the New American Standard translates it, but literally, in my days. This is a daily commitment the psalmist is making. I love you, Jehovah, because you hear my prayers. You incline your ear to me. Therefore, I am going to talk to you daily about all that's on my heart. Our prayer lives, and I won't get off on this too far, but are a very good indicator of how much we love Jehovah. When was the last time you spoke to them, spoke to him? The psalmist says, I love him. I love Jehovah because he hears my voice and my supplications. He inclines his ear to me, and therefore I'm going to call upon him on a daily basis. Now, follow with me very carefully here. You've just got verses 1 to 2 in front of you. Look at them. They set the outline for the rest of the psalm. Verses 3 through 11, 3 through 11 is an amplification of this principle from a personal example of how he hears his voice when he calls upon him. That's what 3 through 11 is, a personal example of God hearing prayer. And then, in verses 12 through 19, we have an explanation or an examination of what it means to call upon him. What we have there right at the end of verse 2. He's going to expand that statement and explain that further, examine that more fully. Right? So this is the way I'm outlining this psalm. The first part is giving us our outline. We're going to look now at a personal example of God hearing prayer. The God who hears my voice and my supplications and inclines his ear to me. The psalmist is going to give us a personal example of God hearing his prayer. As we look at that, notice with me verse 3. The psalmist's distressing circumstances. In this section of the psalm, we have several triplets. Verse uh, 3 has three things that are bothering him. Verse 5 has three descriptions of God. Verse 6 has three descriptions of how God deals with him. Verse 8 has three descriptions of how God rescues him. We're going to look first of all at these distressing circumstances, this trilogy of distressing circumstances. The cords of death encompassed me. The condition is that he is at the point of death. He's not, in one sense, just leading up to death. For the cords are not drawing him. They have bound him. He is being held by these cords in death. Maybe it's some illness. 
Maybe it's some injury. Maybe it's some physical circumstance like poverty or hunger. But he is held in the cords of this death. And the first picture that came to my mind was the person tied up and lying on the railroad tracks and the train bearing down on them. They're in the cords of death. They are about to have it. But then my mind went a little bit broader, a little bit more focused on some of the biblical examples. And Jonah describes his circumstance when he was thrown out of the boat to help us understand this, what it means. Well, Jonah faced this, and here he prays like this. I called out of my distress to Jehovah, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. He's in the water. The water is all around him. You have cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea. The current engulfed me. All your breakers billowed, billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. He's about to drown. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountain. If anybody was ever in the cords of death, that's a picture of it. Or you could think maybe of, of David. How many times was he in the cords of death? with Saul's men coming around both sides of the hill and him having no place to go. Or Saul coming up to the city and the people of Keilah giving him up and telling him, or willing to give up David to Saul, and he's at the point where all looks lost. Or some think this psalm was written by Hezekiah when he had that illness that was unto death and he was going to die. Whatever the case, the psalmist wrote it in circumstances like this where he knew and believed he was dying and death was imminent. He had a sentence of death in himself, like the Apostle Paul would say. But he adds to that, the terrors of Sheol come upon me. Literally, the pressures of the grave found me. In the midst of this, all of these terrors of the mind, all of these pressures that go with dying, and all the fears that, that boil in one's mind found him and began to pressure him and began to squeeze in and crush life out of him. And then, add to that, he looked around to try to find some help, and what did he find? He says, I found distress, more pressures, more grief, and sorrow. Every door I opened looking for some measure of relief, just opened the door to some new, new pain and new problem. One man very perceptively wrote the Old Testament poetry. In Old Testament poetry, death and Sheol are aggressive clutching at the living to waste them with sickness or crush them with despondency. So the singer's plight may equally have been as desperate, a desperate illness, a wounding, or a disillusioning experience. Or, like Job, it could have been both. Those are the psalmist's distressing circumstances. This is a child of God. He said, but this is where I found myself. This is the kind of thing I wrestled with. These were the kinds of struggles and pains that I faced. What was his response? The psalmist's distressing experiences. Secondly, the psalmist's response. I called on the name of Jehovah. Jehovah, I beseech you. Save me. Save my life. He called for help. His life was in jeopardy, so he asked God to deliver him from death. 
And the verb also indicates that it was probably a continuous calling. This wasn't a one-time shot-up prayer and solved everything, but a continual crying in the midst of this difficulty. But then notice, in the midst of the macrame, here is one of the, the most glorious gems and jewels woven into this psalm. Right in the middle of it, there's just this statement about the character of God. Gracious is Jehovah and righteous. Yes, our God is compassionate. Amazing. No introduction. No connections. But it's as though the psalmist says, don't forget, I love a person. Here's who he is. Don't forget, as dark as I can paint it, this is the one who stands behind my desires and my passions, and this is the one to whom I cry. This is the one I call out to in the midst of my tight spots. The one who is gracious. That is the one who gives me that which I don't deserve, actually gives me the opposite of what I deserve, and gives it to me in abundance. One who is righteous. You say, well, I don't want to deal with God on terms of his righteousness. Well, in one sense, that's true. I don't want to deal with God only in terms of righteousness when I stand before, the judgment day, on, before him on the judgment day. But I don't want to call upon a God who's unrighteous or who's capricious or who's arbitrary. I want to be able to call upon a God that I know is going to act according to a standard, a standard which is right and true. And so he says, that's the God I know. I know he'll act in, right, in righteousness. Whatever he does, I may not get what I want, but I know it'll be righteous. And he won't stop being gracious. And he'll never stop being compassionate. And the word compassionate is very close to the word for womb. It draws us into that intimacy and that warmth of the place of a child coming into the world, that place of protection, that place of comfort. He says, is it any wonder I called out to him? This is who I, I look to. This is the God who's behind all this. This is the one that I hold up in the midst of this and to whom I call. And what was the result? Another trilogy in verse, in verse 6. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. The first thing he says is, he says, you know what? This God who is gracious and righteous and compassionate said, you know, this God preserves the simple. Now, the word simple is a word which a lot of commentators like to try to make something good out of. They talk about it being somebody who's inexperienced, young, easily led astray, uh, needing, of, needing instruction and capable of learning. And so they try to put it in that category that the psalmist is saying, this is the kind of person that I am. But the word is most frequently used in the Old Testament for the fool, for the gullible, for the naive, for the careless. One man put it this way, these are the people who roam the pages of Proverbs drifting into trouble. And the psalmist says, Jehovah even preserves them. And I think in essence, he's saying, and that's what I am like. And he may actually be saying, in, in drawing this out, he may actually be drawing the fact that, you know, I'm responsible for some of these problems that I face. It doesn't change what I'm going to do. It doesn't change where I'm going to look. You may be responsible for some of the problems that you're facing and some of the difficulties that you're facing. You're under presently. It may be because of stupid decisions, sinful choices that you have made. It doesn't change what you need to do because God has not changed. Though you're a simpleton, though you're the fool, God remains gracious, righteous, and compassionate. And so the psalmist is our example to call upon the Lord. And he says, what else did he do? I, he says, I looked and I, he preserves the simple. And he said, I was brought low. Literally, I became tiny. 
I think he finally got a right view of himself. There may have just been an indication here that he was a little too proud about how he could handle life. And God brought something into his life to show him, you can't do this. And so he says, God preserves the simple. He humbled me. And he saved me. And he reached down to this worm, this simpleton, this fool, and he came to me and he saved me. I called upon him and this is what he did. This was his response. It was to call to God for help. And this is what he got out of it. This is how God responded. He preserved him. He humbled him and he saved him. A second part of the response, though, of the psalmist, as we look at the psalmist's response to his distressing circumstances, is that he talked to himself. Verse 7. Return to your rest, O my soul, for Jehovah has dealt bountifully with you. Now he does more than just say, suck it up. He does more than just say, calm down. He says, go back. You hear it, see that? Return to your rest. You've left the place where you find comfort and rest and stability. Go back there. Run to that rock which is higher than you. Turn your mind back to that place where you can have perfect peace if you trust in Him. Trust in Jehovah forever. For in God, Jehovah, we have an everlasting rock. Return to the right path like we read of in Jeremiah 6 and verse 16, Jehovah says, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you shall find rest for your soul. Return to the place where your rest is to that rock that is higher than you. Get back into the old paths, the paths, the ways that God has established for you to walk in. Here is the place, the path where you find rest. Get back in, align, in alignment with and look to the good shepherd. For when the good shepherd is leading his sheep, he makes them to lie down in green pastures. He leads them beside quiet waters. He restores their soul. He guides them into the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you need to fear no evil. For he, your rest and your comforter, is with you. His rod and his staff will comfort you. He talked to himself. Now he didn't talk to himself and just make believe, playing a head game with himself and tried to think of nice calm beaches where the waves were coming in and he's sitting in the sun. He's not playing head games and taking himself out of his circumstances. He is getting his mind back upon the place where that rest and comfort is to be found. He says, I called upon God. God heard me. God answered me. He preserves the simple. He humbled me. He saved me. And therefore, I'm reminded in my humbled state to return to the place where rest can be found. And can't you hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ echoing through the psalm here at this point? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, we did that once, so that's all done. Well, I can't look there again. I've got to go somewhere else. That's not just a salvation verse that we see we do once and then we're done with it. We're in Christ and it's all okay. But we need to keep coming back to Him and seeking from Him rest. We need to keep getting under that yoke, His yoke. Here's what God, through the psalmist, is telling us. 
The psalmist exhorts himself to enjoy the peace which God provides. And on what basis can he speak such comfort to himself? The psalmist tells us, because Jehovah has dealt bountifully with me. <laughs> of course, of course I, I should talk to myself this way, because he's a God who's full of grace. He abounds in loving kindness. He abounds in grace. He's, he's full of mercy. His tender mercies are over all his works. Because he has dealt with me so bountifully, why shouldn't I go back to him? I've not exhausted his grace. I've not exhausted his mercy. Knowing that he is such a kind God who hears prayers, I'm going to call upon him again. Trusting in Jehovah to act graciously, righteously, and compassionately, he tells himself to rest in God. Enjoy that peace that such a wonderful refuge provides. Recalling that he has done what he has done above and beyond all that I have deserved. Of course I can talk to myself. Go back. You who are parents, again, you know something of this, don't you? When your children start getting big enough that they think they can walk away from mom and dad and and, and you're holding them, and, and, it's, and they're all comfy, and they say, oh, you know, I, I, it's time to go. And they, they get up, and they start walking away, and something happens. <laughs> back in mom's arms. Back in dad's arms. That's where I should have stayed. That's where the place was rest, of rest was. That's what God calls it. That's what the psalmist is saying he's doing. And he mentions three results of God working for him. Death did not overtake him. Notice, again, now we're at verse 8. For you have rescued my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. He says, having done this, having called upon you, knowing you to be this kind of God, knowing that you preserve the simple, knowing that you've brought me low, knowing that you've saved me, I'm turning back to you for rest. Why? You've dealt bountifully with bountifully with me. What does that mean? You rescued my soul from death. I didn't die. I'm still alive. Another day. Maybe it's another hour. I'm still alive. You delivered me from tears. I didn't drown. God revealed something more of himself to me and cleared my vision of those tears that I might see him more clearly and then he kept my feet from stumbling. I didn't do more harm to myself. I didn't fall into that sin in the midst of it. I was kept from these things. God has kept me. He called upon God. He talked to himself. And in verse 9, he determines to go forward. In light of all this, the fact that my feet don't stumble, I'm going to walk forward. I'm going to walk literally in the lands of the living. The only place where this phrase exists in, in the Old Testament, the lands of the living. So I'm going to find the broadest place where all livingness and all joy of life can be found, and I'm going to walk in that place. And notice what it says, before Jehovah. I'm going to commit myself to, in, to commune with God as an expression of my love for God, I am going to get back in the path and follow after him with the restored footing, the cleared vision, a new lease on life. The psalmist is determined to enjoy fellowship with God and determines to serve God. He says, in these circumstances, here's a personal example of God hearing prayer. I had some of the most distressing circumstances you could imagine in life. And you know what I did? I called upon God. When he answered me, I talked to myself to, draw, to tell myself to go back and commune with God again. And when he met with me and he, and he gave me what I asked for, he cleared my vision, gave me a new lease on life, kept my feet in the path, I committed myself to walk all the more closely to him in the days ahead. There's a fourth thing that he does. And this is, as we heard this morning, one of the wonderful things about the honesty of the Bible. The fourth thing that he does, he speaks hastily. 
Well, this is a couple of the twisted knots in our macrame. These are hard to kind of sort through. This is a very difficult challenge. Hasty words are often known to be sinful words. Proverbs 29, 20 says, You see a man who is hasty in his words, there is more hope for a fool than for him. But nevertheless, they aren't necessarily sinful words. And so verses 10 and 11, I believed when I said, and here he gets intense, I myself, Hebrew doesn't use the first person personal pronoun very often, but he used it here, I myself am greatly afflicted. And then again, I myself said in my alarm, I said hastily, all men are liars. Well, are verses 10 and 11 cranky complaints or insightful evaluations? He describes here something of the effect of the circumstances upon him. He says, notice, I am greatly afflicted. Now this word afflicted, you all understand that word. All you have to do is think back to the way the trees reacted to the recent snow. They were greatly bowed down, weighted down under the snow. He says, that's, that's the picture. I am bowed down, and I am creaking under the pressure. And what's coming out of me is, I'm greatly afflicted. All men are liars. Under the pressure. This is what he does. He speaks these words. Now, here's where the difficulty arises. He could be sinfully complaining about the weight and the length of his trial. And that he is all alone. And everyone's left him. Everyone's disappointed him. He could be describing his circumstances that way. It's more than I can bear. And it's not fair. You all are liars. You're worthless people. That could be what he's saying. Or he could be bowing down under the pressure of the trial. The term can also be used to describe humility. And he could be saying, I am greatly humbled. And all men are liars. But let God be found true. I will not trust in the arm of flesh, but will make God my strength. Which is it? Both, probably. But, if you can do both. But here's the point. Notice the little phrase that starts all this. I believed. Whether they were the cranky complaints under the trial, or whether they are the insightful expressions in the midst of the hurried expressions of his own soul under the pressure that he states these truths, this is humbling to me, and all men are not my strength. God alone is my strength. Whichever it is, in the midst of it, his faith did not die. He remained believing in God. In the first case, if he's believing in God, he's saying something like this. Though I was bowed down to the breaking point and groaned under the weight of my trial, complained under the weight of my trial, and felt all alone, yet I believed God and I called upon Jehovah. If the second is true, that is, they're not statements of complaint or carnal complaint, then the statement is saying something like this. I believed that God was behind all of this and he was graciously humbling me and I forsook the arm of flesh and I trusted in God and therefore I called upon Jehovah. I have a tendency to lean toward the second because the Apostle Paul quotes these words in a context in which he is describing how he is weighed down with troubles and difficulties and how he was being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake and he says, quoting this passage, I believed, therefore I spoke. So he uses this as an example 
that feeling that weight, yet I continued to speak. However we understand these verses, Derek Kidner gives us a clear application here that I want to drive home to all of us. The author makes a point, that is the psalmist makes a point, which his fellow psalmists often illustrate. That to feel crushed or disillusioned, that is, all men are liars, and to say so, even in the wild tones of panic, is not necessarily a proof that faith is dead. It may even be an indication that life remains. You know, if you want to find out if somebody's dead, you can poke them with a needle. You can tickle their foot. And oftentimes that will give you some indication as to whether there's still something in the body. Pain means there's still life. And the psalmist is feeling the pain of it. And in the midst of the pain that he feels, he cries out in that pain. And he says, this hurts. It hurts because I don't understand it. And it hurts because I want to be close to God. And it hurts because I believe God is gracious and compassionate and righteous. And it hurts and I don't understand why this has to come to me. And that may be the expression of life. When our helpers fail and our comforts flee, help of the helpless, abide with me. The personal example of the psalmist in the midst of his difficulties gives us encouragement when we face difficulties to do the same, to call upon the God, to call upon Jehovah for help, to realize and remind ourselves of his gracious, righteous, and compassionate character, how he preserves the simple, to talk to ourselves, to go back to that place of rest that we once knew, and we know where it's to be found, even if we have to search for it for a long time, we keep heading back to the, to the one who gives us rest, back to the paths of rest. We commit ourselves to walking before God, and even when we speak hastily, if there's sin in it, you confess it and you go back to the gracious, compassionate, righteous God and receive forgiveness. Because of the fact that he is righteous, he will forgive you. For if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if there is no sin in it, then go to him in the pain to get the strength and the peace and the comfort that you need. Psalm ends in verses 12 to 16 in the third place with a personal examination of calling upon the Lord. Personal examination of calling upon the Lord. What is the proper response, the psalmist says in verse 12? What should I render to the Lord who does such things for me? Who preserves the simple? Who humbles me to bring me to the point where I cry out to him? who saves me, who delivers me, who rescues me from death, gives me life on a daily basis, wipes my eyes of all their tears, and keeps my feet from stumbling. What do I do for God who gives such benefits to me? Well, the first response the psalmist says is, I have fervent gratitude shown in praise. Verses 13, 17, and 15. I shall lift up the cup of salvation. I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. This is a different manner, and in the Hebrew parallelism, this is describing for us what it means to call upon the Lord. Our calling upon Jehovah is not only a calling upon Him for getting things, but it's a calling upon Him in expressing our praise to Him. To lift up the cup of salvation is an interesting Hebrew phrase, again, found nowhere else in the Psalter, nowhere else in the Old Testament even. And the word literally means to take rather than to lift up. Rather than bringing something to God, it's receiving something from God. And holding on to it and holding it up and saying, Yes, you have been gracious to me. I take this from your hand and I call upon you in praise to praise you for what you have granted to me. I embrace the blessings that you have given and I praise you and adore you all the more. 
and I go through the rituals, I go through the practices of bringing to you my sacrifice of praise, motivated out of a love for you, motivated by the great, great blessings that you've given to me, I come back to you with the fruit of lips, the sacrifice of praise that I bring to you. The primary reason that he lists here for giving this kind of praise to God is notice verse 15. Here's another one of those gems in the midst of our macrame. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Now this verse is most often used at funerals of godly saints, and rightly so. For when a saint passes from this life into the presence of God, God, Christ's prayer is answered, that they may be with me and behold my glory. But you notice the verse is actually used by somebody who was delivered from death, not somebody who died. And his point is this. The death of God's saints is such an important reality that God will not allow it to happen, will not bring it to pass, unless it's absolutely necessary to produce the best glory for His name and is the best for His people. And so it will only happen at the point where He knows it's best. And so He takes care. He doesn't take the death of His saints lightly. He considers it very carefully. The Lord is not looking for martyrs, but that to him it matters, but is saying that to him it matters that a great deal, a great deal whether his servants live or die. And therefore he rescues them frequently and keeps them alive. So the next time you're delivered, remember this verse. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the godly ones. It's so important that he thought it was not ready for me yet. Not for me yet. So there's his fervent praise because God has again delivered him and kept him in the land of the living. But the, the, lastly, there's the fervent gratitude manifested in commitment. Fervent gratitude manifested in commitment. I shall pay my vows to Jehovah. He publicly identifies himself in verse 16 as a servant. Notice what he says. And again, he gets very intense. Oh, Jehovah, surely I myself am your servant. I myself am your servant, just the son of a handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. Why state that? He wants to make it plain. As I come to the end of this psalm, I still love this Jehovah and I love him so much because he has freed me. He has loosed my bonds. Here he's loosed his bonds from the, the cords of death. He's given him life. He's sustained him. He's kept him in the earth so that he might go on. And he says, I'm just your servant. I'm your servant. I am committed to be your servant. But he goes beyond that. He commits himself to engage in corporate praises of God's people. I will pay my vows in the presence of all his people, in the courts of the Lord's house. It's amazing, isn't it? Do you notice how many I's and my's and me's there were as we went through that song? I highlighted all of them. I didn't count them, but there are a ton of them. This is all about me, myself, and I. In one sense. It's all about his Jehovah. But it's a very personal reality. There's a, there's a lot of personal on, things going on here. I felt this way. I've gone through this. I went through this. I called upon the Lord. The Lord ministered to me. The Lord saved me. I did this. He did this for me. I'm committed to this. He is this way. And it just goes on and on and on. I, 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 I myself. And then all of a sudden he says, in the presence of all his people, in the presence of all his people, in verse 19, in the courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Again, I'll quote one of my commentators who captured all this very well. 
the intensely personal faith and love which mark this psalm are not in competition with the public, formal, and localized expressions of godliness. This flame is not withdrawn to burn alone. He didn't say, okay, so I'm going to go over to my closet and just enjoy God. It's not what he said. He says, I'm going to be in the company of God's people and I'm going to worship God as one for whom God has done such great things. And there I'm going to blaze brightly. And as this commentator goes on to say, placed in the midst of the company, it will kindle others and blaze all the, long, all the longer and better for it. I have an advantage over all of you, because I get to sit up here. And that has two advantages. It has a lot of disadvantages, but two advantages. One, when you sing, you're all facing me, and you're ministering to me. And I hear your voices better than just about anybody else out there. And two, I get to see your faces. And I get to see the flame burning bright as brightly as, as you sing the hymns of praise to God and as you hear the word of God being spoken and as you engage in the worship of God. And I get to see that upon your faces and it ministers to my soul. You see, though, it's very, though the, the, what God does for us is on a very personal basis. You see, all that the psalmist described was just physical manifestations, physical deliverances, physical death. I could take every one of these points, couldn't we, brethren, and just run with it in gospel light? Hasn't he delivered you from the bonds of death? Hasn't he taken off of you the pressures of the grave? Hasn't he come to you when all there was was sorrow and despair because of your sin and he has come in grace and righteousness and compassion and delivered you from those things? Weren't you one of the simple foolish ones who was wandering in the paths, headed for all the danger and trouble you could? Wasn't that each and every one of us in our lost condition? And yet he preserved our lives and kept our lives until he humbled us enough and then he came and saved us? And doesn't he call us to rest in him as we saw from the Lord Jesus' words? And doesn't he call us then to take up our cross daily and follow after him, commit ourselves in love to walk behind him? And the question is, what should I render for these benefits that he's given to me? How should I respond to my God who has done such great things for me? Not just physical deliverances. He's done that plenty for all of us too. But the reality of true salvation in Jesus Christ. And so precious was our death in the sight of him that he wouldn't allow it to happen until Jesus had died first. And Jesus, the truth of the gospel, had come to each of us and he kept us alive. Why? That he might draw us to himself. Maybe we're not as thankful as we ought to be because we just don't have the love we ought to have. Maybe it's because we don't appreciate all that he's forgiven us. Maybe it's because we don't appreciate all that he's really done for us in saving us. It's just the air that we breathe. We need to come back to remind ourselves of all that he has done for us and all that we were and are apart from him. And we are but servants, just servants, sons of handmaids, because he has loosed our bonds. The last words of the psalm, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. One is never enough. And when you get a grasp of what God has done, your one tongue will never be enough to sing his praise. And so you'll want to be in the company of God's people because you'll want to be able to be part of that which there's a great company singing his praise. And some of you want none of this calling upon God want none of this humbling circumstances. 
want none of this bowing before him and being a servant to somebody else. Frankly, if you don't want any of those things, then you're not a Christian. And what you need to cry to God for is that he would show you your need, that you would come to him. And being delivered by him, you would be able to say with the psalmist and with us, I love Jehovah. May God help us to sing his praise like the psalmist does. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we plead with you that you would help us as we contemplate the psalmist's words. That we would, like the psalmist, be committed to calling upon you all our days. We might know your comfort and your rest, which you promise to those who trust in you. And that those who are outside of Christ, you would be pleased to work in them, to bow them, not to break them, but to humble them, that, you might, that they might cry to you and that you might save them. We ask that you would hear our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.